Good afternoon. I am Council Member Joe Borelli, and I am Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I want to thank the public for attending today's hearing and waiting the extra 20 minutes uh, until I arrive. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the committee members here present, uh, Deutsch, Maisel, and who's that? Cabrera. Uh, regarding the subject of today's hearing, the committee will conduct an oversight portion related to New York City's innovative approaches to improving FDNY EMS emergency response. In addition to the oversight portion of the hearing, we will hear intro number 1561, uh, which I have introduced, this bill would require the fire department to implement a pilot program for the deployment of motorized scooters for the transportation of medical uh, emergency medical service personnel. As New Yorkers, we know that an operating emergency response within a densely populated urban area is extremely challenging. The FDNY is constantly seeking methods to improve response times and ensure life-saving services that can be promptly delivered to the scene of a fire and in medical emergencies. Through, during today's oversight portion of the hearing, we want to learn how the department has incorporated innovations and technologies for both their firefighting and emergency medical services. We plan to explore how these innovations have helped save the lives of New Yorkers, as well as how the department plans to expand these advancements. The committee will focus on how and what type of training the department provides to both new and experienced personnel on innovations, as well as the cost of rolling out new fire suppression and medical service technologies. Furthermore, the committee would like to better understand areas which the department identifies the needs for implementing new technology. In addition, the oversight portion of this, in addition to the oversight portion of this hearing, I'll say, we will hear intro number 1561, which I discussed earlier in my opening remarks. We've witnessed other jurisdictions having utilized motor scooters to assist in EMS personnel transports to expedite response times in congested urban areas, allowing paramedics to deliver medical care before an ambulance can arrive on scene. My hope is that we can apply this service to the city in order to better assist people in distress who have a medical issue. We anticipate the department will provide testimony on this legislation, allowing us to gain a better understanding of their position on the motorized scooter pilot program. Thank you very much. And uh, our first panel is uh, from the department, if you want to state your name, and the clerk will swear you in. Clerk. Um, clerk sorry, council, sorry. Uh, do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, yes I do. Please state your name and then go ahead. Thomas Correo. Alvin Suriel. Greg Brady. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli and all the council members present. My name is Thomas Correo and I am the Chief of Counterterrorism and Emergency Preparedness for the New York City Fire Department. I'm joined today by Alvin Soriel, Assistant Chief of the Emergency Medical Services, and Greg Brady, Captain of our Counterterrorism Task Force. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Fire Department's use of innovative technologies. Protecting life and safety in the City of New York is an immense challenge, and the Fire Department is constantly assessing and improving the resources that we use to meet that challenge. In a post-9-11 environment, the department is consistently seeking the latest innovations to keep up with emerging threats. One of the ways that we approach new innovations at the fire department is through our research and development unit. The R&D unit, which is part of the FDNY Safety Command, was established in 1980 following a tragic incident that claimed the lives of two New York City firefighters. Procedures were put in place at that time to ensure that the fire department's R&D unit thoroughly tested all safety equipment before it was issued to firefighters in the field. Over time, the role of the unit has expanded. To keep pace with advancements in safety technology, members of the unit proactively research, test, evaluate, and develop new tools and equipment to enhance the safety of firefighters and EMS personnel. They regularly meet with vendors to review equipment and monitor advancements in technology, create pilots, and track internal evaluations of new equipment. Innovations come about in a variety of other avenues as well. Today, we'd like to highlight a few of the more recent examples of innovation that the department has implemented from the areas of firefighting, counterterrorism, and emergency medical service. An area we are constantly striving to innovate is improving situational awareness at an emergency incident. One tool that has been enormously helpful in this regard is the department's recent addition of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. The department began meeting with representatives from the Federal Aviation Administration in 2014 to discuss the potential for the department to begin incorporating drones into our operations. Early testing revealed an immense appeal. 
Drones enable FDNY first responders to collect and relay essential information faster than traditional methods, and they achieve this efficiency at a low risk to our members. Not only does the drone relay critical information to the incident commander at the scene of an emergency, but it is also able to share information via a live video link with the Fire Department Operations Center at FDNY headquarters, where staff chiefs monitor evolving fire and emergency situations 24 hours a day. The department initially opted to respond to incidents using tethered drones. This afforded us a reliable and safe entry into the field of drones, mitigating against risks such as radio frequency interference and allowing us to gather data and better understand the technology. The FDNY's first use of a drone was a response to a fire in a six-story building in the Bronx in March 2017. The tethered drone has a high-definition camera that can zoom in and a forward-looking infrared camera that detects heat signatures, improving the capabilities that an observer would have with the, uh, would have with the naked eye. The feed from the drone allows an incident commander to make strategic changes based on real-time information, providing an operational advantage as well as better ensuring the safety of personnel. A drone tether function as a drone tether functions as conduits for data and power, allowing a pilot to essentially maintain flight and perpetuity, but it does limit maneuverability. While a tethered drone functions as a phenomenal observational tool, an untethered drone with extended mobility and range can serve as an ob observational tool as well as a tactical device. We collaborate with a wide variety of partners at the local, state, and federal levels, including the FAA, who has been very supportive to ensure that we keep abreast of this evolving technology and that we are good partners in this field. The National Fire Protection Association, which creates industry guidelines across the country, released NFPA 2400, Standard on Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Used for Public Safety Operations, which validated many of our policies and procedures. Drone technology continues to advance at a rapid pace. Our use of tethered drones has enabled us to learn the technology and radio frequencies used by untethered drones are stronger than when we started. Battery and motor capabilities have improved and satellite navigational systems have led to better positioning. Safety features such as a parachute system have also become more sophisticated. After much review, we made the decision in 2019 to begin incorporating untethered drones into FDNY operations. We continue to work closely with the FAA to ensure that the department's expansion into the use of untethered drones is supported both operationally and administratively. We will continue to monitor and experiment as the technology continues to advance, allowing us to gather more information and use the drones in new ways that ultimately help us to save more lives. In the area of counterterrorism and emergency preparedness, the fire department studies high profile incidents across the globe to learn from them and better calibrate our own resources and preparation for potential events here in New York City. Events such as the 1999 Columbine school shooting, as well as many other school attacks, the September 11, 2001 attacks, and the 2008 Mumbai attack that combined active shooting, improvised explosives, and fire and smoke as a weapon in what we call a complex coordinated attack, gave us a better understanding of potential emergencies, causing our response capabilities and training to evolve as the nature of the threats evolved. One such event, the 2015 Paris terror attacks, served as the catalyst for the next innovation that I would like to highlight, the mass casualty incident bags. In the wake of those attacks, Commissioner Nigo recognized that the department needed to implement an improved system for responding to complex mass casualty incidents and the department created the rescue task force. Each division task force, there are two in every borough, is made up of 25 FDNY members, including three fire officers, three EMS officers, 12 firefighters, six EMS members, an EMS officer, and a battalion chief. When the program initially launched, the task force carried a standard FDNY MCI bag, which gave it the ability to treat six patients per team. However, after researching contemporary mass casualty incidents, such as the Las Vegas shooting, the department determined that the teams must have the capability to treat a much larger number of patients. The department surveyed the market for a product that would fit our needs, but did not find any that was suitable. So we did what we often end up doing and created our own solution. We designed and implemented two additional ways to equip the teams with the tools to treat a significantly larger number of patients. First, we began affixing a pouch on the front of every task force member's ballistic vest. 
Each pouch contains two vacuum seal bags and carries three tourniquets, one pressure bandage, one combat gauze dressing, 12 triage tags, and two surgical marking pens. With these tools, each member has the capability of immediately treating six patients with critical injuries and triaging 25 additional patients. Second, we outfitted the rescue task force officers with a rescue task force deployment bag. The bag includes 25 tourniquets, 25 combat gauze dressings, 25 bandages, five surgical marking pens, 12 de decompression needles, 12 chest seals, and one sharp shuttle. By equipping, by equipping the teams with the rescue task force deployment bag, each team has the ability to treat approximately an additional 75 patients. With these simple but critical changes to the equipment that our rescue task forces take into the field, we have dramatically increased the team's capability to quickly and effectively treat a large number of patients. The Incident Command System application is a tool that the fire department created in order to give the incident commander the most efficient ability to track, monitor, and record the status of units at the scene of an emergency. Developed in-house, the app enables the incident commander to call up resources about the location, including floor pans and building maps, to assist with planning a response. It can be assessed in the field via iPads and smartphones, taking advantage of the advances in mobile communication to allow members to reliably, reliably receive, transmit, and monitor secure information on a device that is easy to carry and maintain. The app has become a key resource for command and control personnel to assess the situation on the ground and share information from the field to headquarters. Over 500 members of the department use the ICS app at fire incidents, and we continue to roll out the application in a controlled pilot to additional members, including all chiefs, senior executive staff, and department leadership. Going forward, the app will be further incorporated into EMS incidents as well. A ASAP vehicles. These in densely packed environments can prevent a challenge for EMS responders trying to reach a patient, especially with large numbers of pedestrians and foot traffic. In New York City, we have a great deal of these locations. Navigating an ambulance to reach a patient in an area such as Times Square, for example, which also features street closures and pedestrian islands, can slow response times and delay EMS personnel from arriving as quickly as possible. To overcome street closures and pedestrian foot traffic, in December 2017, the department began deploying alternative support apparatus, or ASAP, vehicles. At eight feet tall and five feet wide, the ASAP is smaller and more nimble than a standard FDNY ambulance. Though it is not used for transport, it has all the same patient cap capabilities of an ambulance, including a patient compartment with a full-size stretcher. The ASAP provides a way for EMS members to quickly reach a patient and begin providing care. In the event that the patient needs a transport to the hospital, the responding EMTs or paramedics will be able to treat the patient during the time it takes for a transport-capable ambulance to arrive. We have assigned two ASAP vehicles to respond to medical emergencies in Times Square. They are available seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and we have found that they typically reach patients in under five minutes. We have also begun rolling out ASAPs in other strategic areas of the city, including some funded by city council members. We are grateful for the council's support for this program. Other areas in which we have deployed ASAPs at least some of the time include at Coney Island and Orchard Beaches in the summer, along the route of the New York City Marathon, at the West Indian Day Parade, and we are exploring deploying them to Randalls and Wards Island. The department often tests and pilots new equipment. As the largest fire department in the country, we, often, we are often able to work directly with manufacturers to review new types of devices and explore potential additions. Two relatively recent acquisitions for the emergency medical services have been power stretchers and the simulation training mannequins that we use at the EMS Academy at Fort Totten. One of the more challenging aspects to EMS work is lifting patients. Not only does this sometimes present an operational issue for getting larger patients into an ambulance for transport, but lifting heavy objects can be taxing on our members, leading to strained muscles and other more serious injuries. After launching a request for information and reviewing submissions, the department will soon be testing out models of power stretchers. The device is battery powered and consists of a platform mounted on a wheel frame with adjustable locking positions and armrests, as well as a retractable head section. EMS personnel are able to use the lift to aid in moving and positioning patients that would otherwise be difficult to move. A power stretcher is useful for lifting up to 700 pounds. 
Another challenging aspect to EMS is making sure that members are able to train under conditions that are as lifelike as possible. To this end, the department has acquired approximately 50 state-of-the-art simulation mannequins that members can use in a wide variety of training simulations at the EMS Academy at Fort Totten. The high-tech training mannequins are lifelike and have the ability to simulate bleeding and breathing problems. They can be adjusted to be male or female, and the speed of their blinking can be adjusted to show normal or sluggish rate of response. They exhibit a heartbeat, coughing, and some can inhale carbon dioxide. They contain speakers that allow the patient to speak via the voice of an instructor who is monitoring the training and providing information in real time. EMS personnel are able to vocally interact with the mannequin and provide treatment, including administering intravenous medication and intubation. These are techniques that would be impossible to replicate with live humans, but are necessary to reflect lifelike scenarios that the trainees will encounter in the field. In addition to the hundreds of new EMTs and paramedics that the department trains each year, we provide refresher training to all of our current members, approximately 4,000 in total. By staying current with innovations such as lifelike simulation mannequins, we work to ensure that our members receive the best possible training so that they are prepared to provide expert care when it comes to the real thing. Introduction 1561 would require the fire department to implement a pilot program for the deployment of motorized scooters for the transportation of EMS personnel. Specifically, the legislation would require the department to implement this pilot in locations where accessibility for traditional, for traditional ambulance responses is hindered due to ge geographic considerations or pedestrian traffic. Finding ways to improve EMS response in congested areas is a worthy goal that the department supports. As I mentioned earlier, beginning in 2017, the department designed, tested, and has begun using ASAP vehicles to overcome precisely the circumstances described in the legislation. It is possible that maybe we may want to explore supplementing the ASAP program with an even smaller, more individualized device. However, our focus has not been on motorized scooters, but rather on the notion of whether it would be useful to incorporate a Segway-like personal transport device that could be modified for use, for use by EMS personnel. We are aware of such devices being used in law enforcement contexts, and we know that at least one U.S. city is using a modified version for EMS response at a major airport. The fire department is at the very early stage of this exploration, and we are not certain that a legislative mandate to use motorized scooters would best contribute to that effort but we do remain committed to discussing potential improvements in this area with the council and our colleagues at the Office of Management and Budget. Um, before we take our, our questions, if you allow me, I'd like to play a couple of video, uh, a video clip and also we have a demonstration for you, the MCI kit. Please bear with me, thank you. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a video clip. Um, this is a, uh, a rather large uh, fire um, that occurred. Um, and th this is our drone deployed, um, getting a good view of roof operations. You can see our firefighters operating a roof, hose lines, ventilation going on. Those are tarot letters strategically placed. This is actually a perfect example of how the drones can be used most effectively. Um, the the uh, incident commander is, he's seeing things from street level. It's very, very, he or she is see, seeing things from street, street level. It's very difficult for that incident commander um, to see those type of operations on the roof. The, uh, the use of the, of the drones is tremendously valuable. I've had personal experience with them. I had a very um, significant fire in the Queens, uh, Queens two, um, uh, two holidays ago with a backdraft. Um, and um, it was tremendously helpful for us where we could see uh, areas of tremendous fire extension. It allowed us to put our, pull our firefighters back into an area of safety. Um, it is just a tremendous asset to an incident commander. So, um, and uh, I'd like to, if I can, if I can ask Captain Brady to, if you allow us to talk a little bit about the MCI bag and some of the individual components. Thank you. Sometimes I know what was described in as far as.
Sorry about that. <laughs> you have to start the walk again. Okay. <laughs> um, so the officer would be carrying this bag in a situation where a member has exhausted all their medical equipment from their front pouch. In that turn, we want to make sure they were readily available for a situation like Las Vegas where there was a large amount of patients. Uh, so just, I, I guess, the first question is, how, how often are members brought up to speed in terms of formal training on new technologies uh, when they're implemented? Obviously, a drone is going to be a specialized device, but these seem to be pretty prolific among, among the members. How often are they trained uh, in what these bags are, are, are bringing? Any, any time we have uh, new equipment that comes out, the members are brought in. They're either done one-on-one uh, -on -one training or if it's not uh, something that it's necessary for one-on-one, -on -one, we use a diamond plate, which is basically a video that is put on and gives instruction. And as far as identifying the need for new technologies, um, is there a formal process the department goes through, or is it just someone gets a good idea and uh, you explore it? I mean, what is, what is the, uh, how does the R&D team actually work? Yeah, so um, all uh, uh, new new ideas for new projects actually go through, uh, it's like a research and development portal. Um, so it's tracked really from beginning to end. So, you know, identifying, you know, what the idea is, the need of the department. Um, you know, these might be ideas that have been tried in the past type of thing. Um, and it is, it's, it's very, very um, uh, sort of professional structured in terms of how they go about researching um, different types of innovations, whatever uh, that, whatever particular um, issue that we're trying to deal with. So, um, so right from beginning to end, it's a very structured process. Um, are there new technologies and tactics that are under consideration um, that, that basically will uh, address the, n I forget that one. Uh, regarding intro 1561, um, just take us through the steps the department has taken, um, perhaps other than the ASAP vehicles, to uh, con contest with uh, congestion in some dense areas of the city? So we're in the er early stages of looking into uh, the segways. Um, we like the concept of uh, smaller vehicle, <clears throat> has the third wheel for additional stability. Uh, I like the fact that we can use it indoors. So we're looking at places like Grand Central Station, airports, special events. We can also use them out in the field. Um, so we like that concept. We like the fact that they can be charged uh, just about anywhere and just plugged in um, and we believe that it will definitely increase uh, someone getting to the patient quickly. Is congestion the number one factor uh, of delays between uh, a call and the uh, arrival on scene? I do not have that data but I can tell you it does play a role. Um, just a word on the uh, the, the ballistic vests. Uh, I mean how vital of a uh, of, of a service is this? How important of a service is this uh, to have members equipped with ballistic vests uh, and uh, that sort of equipment? Uh, it's extremely vital, sir. Uh, what we've seen for past incidents is that patients were dying of survivable injuries because we were not allowed to operate in a warm zone environment. Uh, to protect our members, we must outfit them for uh, being put in this new environment to make sure they're protected along with force protection from NYPD. Have uh, firefighters and officers ever in the past worn any sort of uh, ballistic protection? H how old was the program? Was there anything, was there ever a precursor of it or anything like that? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I know e emergency medical yeah. provides. Oh, I, I think I got it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, uh, emergency medical services, I, I couldn't tell you the exact date, but I know that they, when, as they go through the academy and are deployed out, they were the first ones to actually begin using um, uh, ballistic protection. Um, however, I'll, I'll talk, I'll let Greg speak a little more um, because the, the the level of protection that rescue task force members use is, is an upgrade, I believe, so. So the members on the rescue task force will go in with a ballistic protection enough to stop a rifle round. So the difference now is that our members uh, on a normal daily basis are able, they wear a soft body armor that protects them against most caliber handguns. Uh, the members operating in Rescue Task Force need a higher level of protection, so we outfit them with the ability to protect them against a rifle round. Uh, 
There was no, nothing ever like that in the past, though, right? Uh, no, the sir. The Rescue Task Force uh, concept has grown since uh, the Virginia Tech Parkland serve. And, and certainly operating in a warm zone, as you said before, is a, is a new function of the FDNY. Uh, in this capacity, yes, sir. Um, is, is that a change of the, of the role of firefighter and fire officer? Uh, yeah, a absolutely. Um, it, um, it's more of a forward deployment. Um, it's very uh, heavily interagency in, in nature because uh, we go in as a team uh, with law enforcement, with the New York City Police Department. So it's a, it's, um, it's a pretty big leap um, in, uh, in our forward deployment uh, to save lives. Should members be compensated for that leap? Well, I can tell you that that, that will be part of the negotiation talks, I'm sure. Um, so I'm happy to say that uh, we are currently um, – involved in negotiations with OMB and Locals 2507 and 3621. So. Uh, sir, I'd like to add to that. Uh, uh, talking about innovation, this, is, this team is made up of the NYPD and FDNY and EMS all working together with one goal in the situation. Innovation, everybody working together for the same outcome, and that's for the, the citizens of the city of New York to be, have the best possible care in the type of uh, austere environment. Hi, we have any questions? Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Have anybody else? The final panel will be Carl Gandolfo, uh, EMS Local 2507. Thank you. Warren, hey, how are you? Um, so uh, either one of you would like to begin? Hi, well, good morning. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councilman Borelli. And thank you for attendance, Councilman Brennan and Councilman Deutsch. Um, so a couple of the things that we're obviously, you know, we'd like to speak about is the uh, – Let's start at the um, end of the testimony that the fire department gave, and let's let's just discuss the uh, possibility of the Segway scooters for response for our members. Um, I could speak for Oren and the rest of the executive board that uh, we're definitely on board with anything that can improve our response to the patients uh, that we do have to treat, uh, especially in congested areas. Uh, I know Chief Suriel didn't want to give a definite answer of – you know, does it, are response times affected by traffic and traffic patterns that have, you know, emerged in the city over the last at least 12 years? I can say from being a, a, a responder that it absolutely has. It has, it has increased uh, response times due to the congestion and the rerouting of certain traffic. I think that the segways would be a great idea or even possibly something that we could look into that, uh, is made for specifically EMS. I know we have a lot of uh, law enforcement that uses these Segway scooters, whether it's a two-wheel or a three-wheel. But, you know, we, we also have to think about the 80 pounds of equipment that we're carrying that we're bringing to um, to the patients uh, aside because, in, 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 in essence, we're bringing an emergency room to treat our patients. So, you know, we're definitely on board with anything that the department and the city would like to give us that will, you know, make our jobs more convenient 
and not just the convenience factor, but also increase the uh, ability to respond in these smaller uh, spaces and indoors and to be able to get to our patients quicker and get them the help that they need and, and stop that the proverbial clock that we all know in the in the healthcare field of uh, you know those vital minutes that we need to render emergency care. Uh, you know we think with the right training, uh, with the the right driving train driver training, the right uh, you know operational training. You know we'd definitely be on board to work with the city and work with the fire department and find out you know what their ideas are and 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 what they would like us to accomplish you know with it. Uh, I think we have a really good working relationship uh, with our local and the research and development department, specifically on the EMS side. Uh, I know that I sit as an alternate on the Medical Equipment Committee, and we're very fortunate. We have another executive board member, Lauren Hartnett. She also sits as the voting seat on the Medical Equipment Committee, which is cons- which consists of several members from the department from every aspect, from fleet services to medical equipment services, for, uh, to the chiefs, to the uh, EMS Academy, which which uh, is where I'm assigned. And, uh, you know, Captain Yoni Klein and I have a very uh, 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 intimate working relationship where uh, he's definitely looking – towards new innovations and he's on the forefront of putting you know the patient's needs first when it comes to uh innovations in medical care and the equipment that we look at uh you know it's 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 easy to to say yeah we're working together but you know in really in order to prove it i mean some of the things that greg uh, captain brady came up here and spoke about you know that was a a collaboration between our local and you know captain klein being the medical equipment committee liaison for the department who's really you know doing a lot of the research and the development and captain brady as well you know for you know putting their heart and soul into something that they believe in which allowed them to be able to go out and research and find the equipment. And, and I, I want to tip my hat to Captain Brady, and I was telling him downstairs a little bit, you know, what started out specifically for the counterism, counterterrorism task force in the way of some of the equipment, the tourniquets, the, uh, some of the bandages that they use, uh, have now made it on their way to our everyday 911 ambulances. So it's not that it's only in case of an MCI that, that these pieces of equipment will be used and these bags will be deployed. But, you know, we have on a smaller scale – the same equipment now for everyday calls should the need arise and also for the MCIs on, on, on all of our ambulances that we run. So it, it's a good working relationship we have when everybody's in the game, you know, and they have the same goal, and that's patient care first. Uh, the ASAP vehicles, from what I understand, are, are successful in being able to navigate around the tightest spaces. I know one of the places where they're more prevalent is, is in Times Square, uh, with some of the pedestrian plazas and, and obviously gridlock traffic going across town. Anybody who works or lives in New York knows the experience of that firsthand. Um, but we believe, you know, working with the abilities that the department has to go out and, and that unique ability that the chief, uh, the fire chief spoke about up here to, you know, have these special working relationships with vendors really puts us in the forefront of, of, the innovations that are out there in the medical field and specifically for EMS. Uh, I think as more time goes on and uh, more companies become aware of how vital a role we play in healthcare, you know, emergency departments have known it for years and doctors all the way on down through the uh, levels of care have known about the vital role that we have in seeing the patient first. And now that the manufacturers are really starting to come on board and and get behind it, it, it is a promising uh insight to you know what we actually do um one other thing i just wanted to speak about uh very briefly was along with that relationship that we have with uh captain yoni klein you know uh we're able to speak on a daily basis because we're both assigned up there and, and you know he has really played a vital role in in putting together some of the uh some of the things, like including the powered stretches. You know, I, I'm lucky enough to sit on that subcommittee for the powered stretches, and I have to say that working with not only him but with the Chief Bonson, with Chief Bonsignor's office and, and the rest of the members of the department that are on that subcommittee, it, it has moved along very smoothly. And, and it's, a, it's another piece of equipment that, that reduces the stress on, on the provider and, and, and keeps them healthier and allows them to be able to, you know, obviously do the job that they're, that they're tasked to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Borelli. I just want to talk.
talk about a few points. We are obviously in support of anything that will reduce response times in our city. Uh, our concern is mainly safety. Uh, should this resolution go through, and I hope it does, is that it will be mandated to have two crews respond at all time. Our members are always facing dangers. Our members are constantly assaulted. Having one of them respond will put potentially put them in harm's way. Uh, I can see this working in the Times Square area, anywhere in Midtown area. Sometimes going around a city block could take 10 minutes just to go around one block. In a Segway scooter, you just flip it on, see, you know, flip it, and you go the opposite way. So this could definitely work, and response times will reduce in our city. Um, you mentioned compensation. Obviously, that's always something that our members uh, will demand, uh, more training, more compensation. So we appreciate you bringing that up to the department. And um, we look forward to working with you. Or when you say two members, do you mean two individual scooter riding members or a person in some sort of fast scooter and then the, the actual ambulance that would come in to support them afterwards? Two separate vehicles. Thank you. Anyone have questions? That's it. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It looks like that is the last panel today. Thank you. This concludes the hearing.